Hey, everybody. Welcome to this Light Bearers Bible study. This is part two of our series on the three angels messages. Last week, we did part one with Ty and our friend Jonathan Leonardo on the everlasting gospel. And tonight we have Ty and we're joined by our friend Kessia Rain Bennett from Union College where she pastors. Hey, Kessia, we're really glad you're here. And we are going to be talking about the fear of God. I'm going to let hand the time over to them. They're just going to take over. But I just wanted to remind everybody in the chat to, as the study progresses, you can ask questions. If the content they're going over generates questions in your mind, feel free to ask them. You can click the ask a question tab at the bottom of your screen. Ty, do you want to start us off with a word of prayer? I'll do that. Thank you, Allie. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that you would preside over our minds and help us to see things we haven't seen before. We, we want to understand, not for the sake of being stimulated intellectually merely, but we want to know you more intelligently so that we can love you more passionately. God, please connect our heads and our hearts. May we not merely be pursuing knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but Lord, may we be pursuing the knowledge of you our God, so that we may fall in love with you and to serve you with our whole hearts. So Father, please open our minds right now. Please send your Holy Spirit to instruct us. We confess our weakness before you and ask that you would give us more than human understanding. Please do not leave us alone in this time that we spend with you in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Kessia. The first thing I want to say is I love you. <laughs> it's, <so beautiful. laughs> it's been it's 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 been a while. It's been it's been a minute since I've seen you. So it's great to see you. Um, a lot of people a lot of people don't know where you are except that uh, Ali just mentioned you're at Union College. Could you briefly just say what you're doing there? Yeah, so um, I look at Union College out my window here. We're kind of uh, just across the street from their campus. I'm here at the College V Church. So I'm the pastor for discipleship, which is ah. I get to do whatever I want because all of Christianity is discipleship. So it's great. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And um, hey, just real quick, what? how old were you when we met the first time? Ooh, when we met the first time? I was like a brand new baby Christian when we met. I must have been like, 15 probably 15 yeah i think the light bear convocation yeah up in northeastern washington state that's right yeah oh, geez. and and when and when you came to to that event i don't remember all the details but but is that the one that you preached at the that first one you came years you, later that was the year a couple years later that was okay okay 20 july's ago 20 July ago, that's right, <laughs> that's a long time ago. And now, um, for those of you who are tuning in for our, our Bible study, Kessie and I are longtime friends, and uh, she is, I've known her since she was 15 years old, and she is now a mommy. She has, she has two precious little children, and they are how old? Two and three. Two and three years old, and Kessia has informed me that they're speaking whole sentences, which is understandable because, because Kessia is a sentence factory. She is a, <laughs> she is, she is a, a human, a human being from whence sentences come, from whence sentences come. Nobody's ever described you that way, but that's how, that's how I'm, I'm describing you from now on. You are a human being from whence sentences come. New Twitter bio coming. <laughs> Love it. Okay, Kessia and everybody else. It looks like we have uh, just a bunch of people on here. We got, I see Georgia. Um, I see somebody from the Bay Area. I see somebody from uh, Michigan. Uh, here's somebody from California, Canada, Alberta, Canada, uh, the Dallas, Oregon. We got somebody, Kessia, we got somebody from Orlando, Florida, where they are bobbing and weaving, trying not to get the coronavirus. Oh, no. <laughs> they are trying hard down there not to get it. I uh, got somebody from Houston, Texas. I won't keep scrolling, but but uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. Glad you're, you're uh, interested in the Bible. Glad you want to study the word of God. It is powerful. 
It is a, a book that is, according to the Apostle Paul, it is living. The, the book is alive, everybody. It's alive. This book is alive. And it speaks life into our hearts, our minds, and to our relationships. And so thank you for taking an interest in Scripture. Now, we have had two previous online Bible study series, one that was titled Obstacles to Faith. And then we transitioned into a series on um, basically the social justice passion of early Seventh-day Adventist pioneers. That was super exciting. Mm -hmm. And now we are studying something that is very near and dear to my heart and to many people's hearts, uh, the three angels' messages. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with that terminology, the three angels' messages are found in Revelation 14. It is, just as the words indicate, a series of three messages that are delivered, that are proclaimed by three angels from mid-heaven. This is a vision John is having, so it's symbolic. The word angel in scripture for the note takers, just write this down, just write down the word angel and then a uh, M dash and write the word messenger. That's, that's what it means. An angel is a messenger. Sometimes in scripture, an angel is a literal angel, which is a, a particular kind of creature, a particular kind of being that God has made who, who are different than humans, but like humans in some ways. That's a different subject we might look at in the future, but they are rational, they are sentient, and they are volitional. And it's a different order of beings. Uh, they are asexual. They're not male or female, according to Jesus. And they are interactive in human affairs. So those are literal angels. But then in addition to literal angels, you guys, sometimes in scripture, the word angel is just used to indicate message or messenger. For example, let me give you an example. In the last book of the Old Testament, in Malachi chapter three, the coming Messiah is called the messenger of the covenant or the angel of the covenant. So Jesus can be an angel in the sense that there are times when he has identified for his message delivering activity. So he's an angel in that sense. He's not an angel in the sense of being that particular kind of you know, different order of being that we talked about, but he's an angel in the sense that he delivers messages. Well, the three angels' messages in Revelation 14 are symbolized by three angels flying in mid-heaven. And obviously, when you read the messages, they are symbolic of God's church on earth giving that message. Because in the first angel's message, they proclaim the eternal gospel. Well, Jesus closed his ministry by charging his church. That's your job, church. That's your job. Your job is to proclaim the gospel to the world. And so the people of God uh, are angels in the sense that they are messengers. We're not all super angelic. Um, Kessia happens to be more angelic than most. She's definitely more angelic than me. Um, but we're not angelic, but we are angels in the messenger sense. So that's what the three angels message is. And we're going to systematically, just so you know where we're going, that's a little intro, systematically move through all three of these messages in Revelation chapter 14. Now, last week was part one, and we read the first angel's message, which in Revelation chapter 14 simply says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the eternal gospel, uh, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language group, and people. So it's global. This is a global phenomenon. Goes to everybody. Saying, now we're in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of waters. That's the first angel's message, everlasting gospel. And then the angel says, fear God and give glory. And so there is this message that, that is included. Now, Kessia, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna state the obvious. The gospel is good news. Yes, that is in the definition. It's 
And then right after that, okay, the gospel, good news, fear God. What? 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 Fe what? So what in the world? If the gospel is good news, why is the first angel following up the everlasting gospel by saying, I've got good news for you, and it's the gospel. Now, fear God. What does fear have to do with good news? Are these two discordant notes? Or is there some kind of, you know, it's like, it's, it's like me saying, hey, Kessie, I have really good news for you. You're pregnant and you're going to have another baby. Be afraid. Yeah. No, it's much better than that. I, right. I'm glad you're asking this because when I hear about fear, I feel like that that is that that's in the air right now. Don't you feel that? Oh yeah, I feel it. Coronavirus and economic fears and and political fears and and then you think about kind of end time fears. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like what we need is more fear. Um, so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself as I read this, this scripture, fear God and give glory to him. And that, that was the thing that made me go, okay, 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 wait, fear God. Right. So mm. I fear lots of things. Like I fear, um, spilling spaghetti sauce on my new sweater. I am a pro at that. Then I don't have any, then I don't have a good sweater anymore. You know, I'm afraid of my own folly. In other words, I'm afraid of how other people are going to harm me. I'm afraid of the world events, right? We can be afraid of lots of things. I'm afraid of catching a right, disease. Right. But fear God. Um, oh, I see what you're doing there. You're putting the emphasis on God. Yeah. Because so I shift, shift your, yeah. Because, because um, when I went, so I, I I came up to uh, Light Bears Convocation 20 years ago and, and preached there, and it was awesome. But right before I came to Light Bears Convocation, I went to the Goat Rocks Wilderness uh, there in Washington. Have you ever been to Goat Rocks? Ever backpacked? No, no, oh, no, no, I haven't. It's amazing. Sounds like I missed it. Okay. Yeah, you still have a chance. You're alive. You can still go. Um, okay. But it, it's, you're right there in the wilderness. It's the Goat Rocks Wilderness. And you've mm. been in some wilderness. Do you ever I feel have. you're on, on some height and you just see a snowstorm coming or you watch a yeah. lightning storm or you just look at a precipice or you catch sight yeah. of the Milky Way for once. Right. And there's that awe that settles over you. Yeah. That, that's a result of being small when you see something big and truly awesome. Right. Truly inspiring, truly like, I am not in control of this. I did not make this. Mm. I am mm. not, I, I bear no rule over this. I am subject to whatever beauty this is, whatever power this is. I'm, I'm, mm. Mm. you know what I oh, mean? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so you're equating, I, I think you just did two things. First of all, you said there's a lot of things in the world to be afraid of, and you suggested that the first angel's message is saying, shift your fear to God, as in don't fear anything else. There's nothing else really to fear. Shift your fear to God because God has your best interests at heart. It's kind of like this just came to my mind. I don't know, you know, when you raise children, you have lots of stuff in your head that's left over all the children's books you read. Um, did you ever read where in the Chronicles of Narnia, where where C.S. Lewis portrays uh, Jesus slash God slash the Lord as, as the lion Aslan? And mm -hmm. Aslan is a lion. A lion is a, a, a pretty scary creature. And the children encounter um, the idea of Aslan through through some of these inhabitants of, of, of Narnia, right? And they're describing Aslan slash God slash Jesus in these really, you know, extremely 
you know, awe inspiring terms. And the children, you can just kind of picture them, their eyes are like saucers and they're not blinking and they're like, what, what, what? And, and so then one of the children, I think it's Lucy in the story says, well, is, is Aslan safe? And the beaver says, oh my, no, 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 no. No, he's not safe, but he is good. Doesn't that make all the difference? <laughs> that, I mean, that, think about that. Yeah. Think about the genius of that. Yes. <laughs> he, yeah. He's not safe, but he's good. So in a sense, yeah. he's safe. We want a we want a fierce savior, don't we? Mm. And that's yeah. just the kind of God that we have. And I was telling someone uh, the other day, looking up at the stars, I used to be afraid of the stars. Like, like they inspired in me a kind of awe that, but that was um, mm -hmm. fearful. Like, like yeah. uh, it, because they were so distant and, and, and without, without faith, all I saw yeah. was the vacuousness of space right. and emptiness and meaninglessness, you know? Yeah, yeah. But then when you know the God that made those stars, you still yeah. feel small and humble. Mm, mm. You still feel yeah. awe. You still feel, you still feel a deep existential reverence. But now yeah. you know that that God knows your name, knows how many hairs are on your head. Yes. In fact, would give all the stars all of himself to be in yeah. your company. I mean, doesn't yeah, that yeah. Mean yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. So to fear, to fear God, I mean, the word fear, well, well, Cassie, let's look at some scripture. I, I, I have a couple of verses that I want to throw at you and see what you think of these verses. Because it's kind of, the first one is a little strange. And I want to ask everybody who's tuning in, look this up. You're going to be blown away by this. This is in Exodus 20, which is a familiar chapter of the Bible to those who have spent um, any time studying scripture. Uh, that's where the Ten Commandments are. Okay. So in, in Exodus chapter 20, after the mountain has been shaking and there's lightning and there's thunder and the Ten Commandments are given and the voice of God just rolls over the people like, like thunder. Look at verse 20. Look at verse 20 of Exodus 20. That's an easy one, everybody, to remember. Exodus 20, 20. And what you're looking for here is the word fear is used twice. It's used two times. And you're going to see why I said this is kind of a weird text. Uh, verse 20. And Moses said to the people, do not fear. There's the first usage of the word fear. Do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the word fear, did you guys catch that? Kessia, did you catch that? The word fear is used two times. The first time it's used is don't fear. Don't fear. So, so the text literally, if you just, you know, do a little bit of editorial work on it, the, the, the verse basically says, don't fear, fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't fear. Mm -hmm. God has come to you to test you that you may fear him that you may not sin. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the word fear is being used two times there. One time, don't do it. The other time, do it. Yes. So since we're in Exodus 20, <clears throat> You mentioned the lightning and the thunder and all that. It was a super intimidating scene, right? If you mm -hmm. you saw a mountain on fire and, yeah. and a voice that boomed and, yeah, and yeah. just created forest you'd fire. You'd freak out. Yeah. Yeah. You would fall down, you'd you'd cry, you'd wet your pants. It would be it would be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. But then the people say in verse 19, they tell Moses, okay. you speak to us. And we will listen. So God is trying to speak to the people from the mountain, right? Yeah, yeah. They're hearing his voice. They're seeing this manifestation of his power in the mountain. And they say, make it stop. Mm, mm, mm. You speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us or we will Lest die. Lest we die. Yeah. Isn't that something? 
but most of us are like, oh, if only, like, God, just speak to me. And these people are like, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to hear it. <laughs> like, it's too much. It's too much. Too, like, we can't yeah, hear it's me. overwhelming. We would rather have oh. Moses, the mediator, than just hear yeah, yeah. God's voice in our ears. You know, so, um, somebody said to me years ago, uh, a person who would have regarded himself as uh, an agnostic, maybe even an atheist. Mm -hmm. And he said, Ty, this is a very simple matter. Very simple matter, Ty. All that needs to happen is if God exists, he just needs to manifest himself, show up and say, y'all been wondering whether there's a God or not? Well, yes, there is. And here I am. If God would just come out from wherever he is and show himself to me, I would believe and I said to him, I don't think you want that. <laughs> I don't think you want that. Mm -hmm. Because if God were to show up right now in all his unveiled majesty, something would take place. Your free will would recede mm -hmm. by the sheer magnitude of his overwhelming presence you would cease to have the ability to process information rationally. You would cease to have the ability to choose him. So actually God is doing you a favor. Uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, he, very interestingly, he says, the absence of God is an illusion. And what he means by that is he's saying, listen, God, if God is, hides behind the veil of reality projecting his character through the cracks in this in the wall so to speak so that our freedom is intact wow that to, the degree, so to the degree so to the degree to the degree that god were to you know expose himself and lean in we would find ourselves automatically submitting to him out of sheer terror rather than out of a rational assessment of his character. So yeah, we don't want God to show up, you know, as tall as the Empire State Building and say, hey, you've been wondering whether there's a God or not, I am. I suggest you get your act together. Well, we'd all get our act together. There'd be a mass baptism. The whole world would, <laughs> would become believers. And the question would still remain, does any, anybody love God? Yeah. That, that question would not be answered by us submitting to God in, in sheer terror of his presence, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And in so fact, God, I God, think, is doing God, something. Yeah. What, say it again. Well, God, God honors their request. So, right. He speaks through Moses as a mediator, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he, he says, here I am. And everyone says, please stop. And so he yeah. proceeds back again behind that veil using a mediator. And not, yeah. not that he can't be seen or known. In fact, the Bible would tell us just the opposite of that. And my eyes are telling me the opposite of that right now. But, yeah. but that demonstration of his majesty, especially yeah. when it comes in conflict with mm -hmm. my... Uh, you know, my patterns of thought and living, my my weak biology, yeah. my 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 darkened mind, my tendencies, when it runs yeah. up against whatever whatever kind of uh weakness there is in me, I mean I, I could be blown to smithereens just by the Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. the child the child that behaves properly in the presence of daddy. That's a different dynamic than the child that behaves properly when daddy's not around. Mm -hmm. You see that? So, so there's a difference between those dynamics. The child that behaves, or let's say the teenager, the teenager that behaves when mom and dad are home, but mom and dad leave and the house becomes a hedonistic party with all of her friends, right? Mm -hmm. These are two different relational dynamics versus the teenager whose parents leave for a few days and she continues to honor her parents' premises and will and character because she shares their, she loves them. Yes. You know, she's not just performing when they're looking, she's doing 
what she knows she ought to do because you know their externally imposed ought has become an internally realized I want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. So and what I like about Exodus twenty twenty is that Moses is saying you have the wrong kind of fear, right? He's making that yeah. distinction. You're af you're so afraid you don't want to hear God's voice. No, 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 no. God, yeah. God is not that kind of person that you you're afraid of. So you push them away. God yeah. is so awesome and majestic. He's here to show you how majestic He is. But that's the kind of He's majestic in righteousness. And what we yes. see, especially especially made clear in the Old Testament is that the fear of God, and that, that's a very common phrase throughout scripture, especially in, mm -hmm. in the First Testament, is really, it is a synonym for righteous living, right? Yeah, so yeah. there's no fear of God before their eyes, the psalmist says, and mm -hmm. then goes on to say yeah. how they do all these wicked things. Um, yeah. Jesus mentions this in the parable of the unrighteous judge in Luke 18. He says, this woman knocks and knocks and knocks and he won't do the right thing. And he finally gives in. But he, in confessing his own unrighteousness, he says, I have no fear of God. Right? Like, mm, I, don't, mm, mm. I don't have this morality. I don't have this sense that there's anything greater than me. I'm accountable mm. to nothing. Right. Nobody. Right? Nobody. Yeah. And, and the opposite of that is I live in an awareness that I am not the greatest thing out there. I'm not the biggest yeah, yeah, thing yeah, out there. And yeah, actually, yeah. I do live in common with all other people in accountability yeah, yeah. to a, yeah, yeah. a holy, righteous, loving God. And so that makes mm. such a difference. Um, you know, the the kind of God we're fearing, if we see him as um, like these Israelites did in Exodus 2019, We'll be afraid of him like the like Lucy was afraid when she first heard of Aslan. Oh, mm -mm. he's big, he's fierce, he's powerful. And and you go, well, most of the time when people have power, you know what it turns into is yeah. Yeah. control, subjugation, domination. Is is that this God? Absolutely not. And you, you when you take the whole testimony of the scriptures, yeah, yeah. then we understand. But fear of God. So, so you're, you said there's a right kind of fear and a wrong kind of fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, we mentioned before you were talking about fearing God. It's to be, to fear God is to not be afraid of powerful people. Whoa. So, I love that. Say that again. Okay. To fear God is to not be afraid of powerful people. Yeah. So let me throw some yeah. verses at you. Okay. Okay. So New Testament verse, 1 Peter 2, 17. Mm -hmm. First, you know, Peter writes this epistle to these strangers, uh, you know, and aliens in the earth. You know, they, they're living as exiles. In other words, they're Christians who are being persecuted. They're okay. suffering for their witness for Christ. Mm -hmm. And okay. they're going through all these trials in their lives. Peter gives them the, these really pithy statements. Love the family of God. He says, in first Peter 2 17, fear God, honor the emperor. Don't mm. fear the emperor. Don't fear, fear the God. emperor. Honor the emperor. Yeah. And he spends the, the he spends the passage talking, uh, and he says in other places, don't don't be afraid, don't give in to fear. Mm. He spends this book saying, God's got you, you're safe with God. Fear God. Yeah, yeah. Honor yeah. the emperor. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and yeah. um Deuteronomy 3.22, God tells the people, you're going to go, uh, these kings are going to oppose you. And he says, don't fear them because it's mm. Yahweh, your God, who fights for you. We don't, we don't fear them because we know who's higher, more powerful, in charge. And it's not, yeah. the emperor only gets so high, but way above him is it's the God. Lord God Almighty, our yeah, God. Yeah. Our father, yeah, 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 yeah. Our savior, you know, I'm yeah. not afraid of him. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. It fear yeah. of God is to trust Him above all others. Mm -mm. So good, so good. Okay, so what about Proverbs eight thirteen? I think fits with this. It says, "The fear of the Lord is to hate evil." Yes. 
Okay, so so if I if I this is really I think this is amazing because because God is intrinsically essentially good. Mm. If if I if I lodge all of my fear, my awe, my respect in him, then I'm going to see things in him that will cause me to hate evil. Hmm. So what this this text is saying a number of things, but one of the things it's saying is that if I fear God, I'm going to hate evil. That tells me that what I'm not going to encounter in God, Cassia, is any evil. That's exactly there's nothing there's nothing in God to be negatively afraid of, be, because there's nothing bad, evil that is ever going to proceed from the Lord. What, what's going to proceed from from the Lord is is what is in my best interest, and so there's a legitimate awe and fear. But but this also means something else. If God is diametrically opposed to all evil, right, then to fear God is to hate evil. And if I know God as God is, I'm probably going to have a state of mind in which I don't want to do things, i.e. evil, that he is diametrically opposed to. I have not only the fear of God as a follower of, of Jesus, but I have what I call the fear of Sue. That's that's my wife. Okay, I have the fear of Sue. And here's the fear of Sue. <laughs> The fear of the the fear of Sue is the beginning of wisdom for Ty in some ways, and here's how. Sue and I have been together. I, I'm just going to use this because it's a real experience that I've had all these years. That kind of is a microcosm, I think, of of what we're talking about, and that is that I am so in awe of how loyal and faithful and loving and good she has been to me all these years from the beginning. She's that I've always been nervous about hurting her. Mm -hmm. Maybe nervous isn't the right word, but nervous about hurting her in the sense that, I mean, even to this day, Kessia, like I'm in Tennessee right now with my daughters. And I've, I've, I haven't seen Sue for like four days. And it'll be about three more days, and then and then I'll go back, and I'll be a, a little like I want her to like me. I want her to. I want. I'm kind of. I get butterflies in my stomach because I don't want to disappoint her. I don't want to be anything less than what she deserves. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh. So if that can happen on a human level, right? If that can happen on a human level and we're pretty messed up, we're dysfunctional, we're, we're weird, we're, we're silly, we're stupid, we're idiotic. If that can happen on the human level, I mean, seriously, God is so good that to fear God is to hate evil. That, 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 that's what scripture is saying in Proverbs 8, 13. Why would I want to do anything to hurt him? Why would I want to do anything contrary to what pleases the Lord because of all he is to me and all he has done for me. I, another, uh, uh, you know, kind of modern way that we say this kind of thing is if you love somebody, you don't take them for granted, right? You don't just assume and take advantage of the situation, right? Mm -hmm. Just because God loves me doesn't mean, you know, I, I don't say, oh, God loves me. So I'll sin with gusto. <laughs> I don't say, oh, God is good and forgiving and wonderful, so I'll do whatever I jolly well please. Right. It's more like, oh, God loves me. He's amazing. He's good. I love him. Oh, I just want to be yeah. what he wants me to be. Yeah. And right? you know, I like that because um, we can even know God as a true God, know him as our Savior, and still live under a really a bondage of fear. We can be mm. so afraid of messing up, so afraid of not getting all the right steps in order that yeah. we're afraid we'll lose him. And not in this way, like you're talking about with Sue, which is like, you know, the, 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 the this nervousness to, to hurt or injure or disappoint, but, but more the sense of, Oh, I'm hanging by a thread. And if I just yeah. make a misstep, you know, we can live under a fear of God 
And I think the 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 antidote to that mm. is to dwell on this goodness. Because yeah. you know, I mentioned I can feel small, I can feel the fear of something that's that's awesome and majestic, mm. but they don't care for me at all. Like a like a lightning storm. Right. Like yeah, yeah. if you see that coming and you're out exposed on the mountain, right. that's a different yeah. kind of fear. Then when you're cozy yeah. in your house and you know you got your thing and it's yeah, hot yeah. and you watch the, I mean like it's a different experience. Do you feel exposed and and alone? Do you feel vulnerable in that sense of I'm just barely hanging on and I could lose it at any second? You know my life could come to an end because of this, or is it that that reverence from from the vantage point of safety and embrace? You know, mm, mm, mm. I think <laughs> what you're saying, I love what you're saying. And, and I, I, I used an experiment years ago with a group that I was I was teaching a series of classes and they were they were saying, well, how do I know if I have the right kind of fear or the wrong kind of fear? Hmm. And I said, OK, here's how you can know if you have the right kind of fear of God or the wrong kind of fear of God. If you mess up is your inclination to run from him or to him? Yes, that's Exodus so, 20. What, that's what? That's Exodus 20 again. Again, yeah. Running away like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So how can I know if I have the right kind of fear of God or the wrong kind of fear? If I mess up, if I sin, if I fail, is my, is my immediate impulse to then pull away from God mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or to lean in and say, oh Lord, you, okay, the right kind of fear is going to drive me to the Lord. The wrong kind of fear is going to make me be frightened of him because I don't have the everlasting gospel in my peripheral vision. There's there's no good news. All mm -hmm. there is is bad news. God, I have a wrong picture of God and a wrong picture of the character of God will drive me away from him when I fail rather than draw me to him yes. when I fail. Yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's oh, a good yeah. experiment, right? That is exact. That is exactly the thing. You know, when we understand, when we understand that God is for us. Yeah. Just how many ways God spent sixty-six books telling us this, and He sends it by the yeah. messenger of His Holy Spirit every single day. God is yeah. for us, for us, for us. So I find that to be the starting place for the antidote. And if you want to know how for you he is, you know, Romans yeah. starts to tell you, this is how for mm -hmm. you he is. First of all, he was for you before you were born. Okay, before you yeah. were you, he was for you. <laughs> and then he made plans for you. And then he saves you, justifies you. He glorifies you. He, he yeah. is so for you that there's no one who can condemn you. And so by, by putting our minds to how for for us he is when you have the most powerful being in yeah. I mean, the universe seems like too small of a word yeah yeah the most he transcends it yeah, yeah. i mean it's, not like it, it's something he holds in his hands he's got multiverses you know yeah it's nothing to him when he is for you yeah and he and yeah. he poured out all that power for yeah yeah you. yeah that's romans 8 you know, you know, where Paul is saying basically that if God is for you, who can be against you? His love is the thing, the thing, the thing, the thing that trumps all other things. There is no other thing that can come between you and the love of God, because Paul says in Romans 8, he's for you. He's for yeah. you. He's for you. OK, I have another text. Oh, okay. And this one, I, I, I love this so much, Kessia. And everybody else, those of you, hey, write this down. And I want to ask all of you, whoever you are, wherever you are on the planet, write down Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4, and give this some serious meditation. Read it like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, and just read it, ponder it, ponder it, ponder it. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it really slow. And here is a, a weird, again, it's strange. The Bible... The Bible, I say weird, some of these texts like, like the Exodus 20, 20, fear, don't fear, fear, um, is because we're, we're not understanding the words the way the biblical writers are using the words sometimes. So it appears weird to us 
with our modern vernacular. But watch this. There, there, there's a comparison of two ideas here that don't seem to go together. Okay, check this out. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who should stand? Well, it's a, it's a rhetorical question. The obviously implied answer is nobody. We would all be completely just sunk. There would be nothing. Okay, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who should stand? But watch this. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Amen. What? So forgiveness generates fear? Don't we, we tend to use the word fear in the sense of terror, mm -hmm. right? So we don't, we think, okay, you know, if somebody says, you know, I forgive you, our natural response isn't, oh, now I'm afraid of you. But that can't be how he's using the word. He's saying, he's saying, God is so merciful that he does not mark iniquities. He's not, he's, he's not, a, he, he, he's not, you know, he's not got a list and checking it twice to see who's naughty and nice. God is not a, a, a miser with grace. Yes. God, yeah, God is full of grace. It just flows from him. He doesn't mark iniquities. His forgiveness is full and free flowing. So fear him. What? It just, yeah. it has to mean be in awe of yeah. him. Just be, just, just be in blown away wonder at the kind of God that God is. Because yeah. look at how forgiving he is. Look at how merciful he is. What I Don't love, you love that, that text. I do love that text. It, you know what I, what I, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because what I hear in the first angel's message is a pertinent uh, medicine for our time in in a couple ways. Mm. Number one, there are those of us who there is no fear of God before our eyes. You know, not you and yeah. me, but just in the world. There, there are people. There is no fear of God before their eyes. They came from nothing and nowhere. Nothing is greater than they are. It's all about control. I just do whatever I can get away with. You know, no yeah. accountability, yeah. whatever. We need to we need to see that there is a fierce God in the universe. We need to yes. see that there is a God of immense power who even just by speaking creates something amazing like light. Like you try that. Yeah, button. yeah, yeah. But on yeah, the other yeah. hand, this is the fear of God set in the context of the eternal gospel. And when, when mm -hmm. we read in Revelation 14, this is coming, this is right there at that center of the book. There's a lot going on mm -hmm. that is scary in the book of mm -hmm. Revelation. But the message of Revelation 14 of that first angel is to fear God, not the merchants, not the sea beast, not the land beast, not, not the plagues, to fear God. Because when I fear him, I'm not going to be afraid of powerful people. I'm not going to be afraid of, of uh, the catastrophic events that are going yeah. to overtake me as if mm, I'm just mm. a blip on some cosmic screen. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I reverence wow. God who is awesome in his power and in his mm -hmm. being. He, he yeah, has yeah. goodness that will blow your mind. And when he yeah, blows yeah. your mind, you don't have time yeah. to be freaked out by everything that fl that flits across the yeah the yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes yeah well i'm looking at the comments here and i'm looking up some of the verses that people are um i think it's irene is offering second corinthians chapter 7 verses 10 and 11 thank you for that text it's powerful i want to encourage everybody to note that and look up that text this is where this is where the Apostle Paul is talking about, um, you know, godly sorrow that produces repentance versus a kind of sorrow that that basically just takes for granted, um, you know. Yeah, and then the word fear is used. Uh, well, yeah, I think down in verse eleven, what diligence is produced in you? Um, what clearing of yourself what indignation what fear what vehement desire what zeal 
what vindication yeah so so thank you for that text by the way um irene because essentially you know when we encounter god and we have the right kind of repentance you know all kinds of very strong powerful emotions are going to start emoting in us like vehemence against evil and to hate evil and and you know a, a kind of a kind of fear that is is you know grips us takes takes charge in in a sense and so so uh i think our time is almost up and we're going to go to q and a's but i'm going to throw one more concept on the table and see what you think about it I, i've been toying with this concept for years and um i don't know if it's true or not but i'm just going to throw it out there see what you think about it okay i've asked people over the years hey you know what's the first bible verse that what's a common bible verse that you know and a lot of people know john 3 16 you know for god so loved the world another one that is very common so apparently it's been quoted a lot even though i wasn't raised in in the church and and so i never heard it but i guess a lot of people are raised with this verse because a lot of people say oh the verse i have memorized that i remember is the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom yes. the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom the fear of the lord okay so this is a common verse it's in proverbs the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom here's the idea that i'm just going to throw on the table see what you think about it maybe it's right maybe it's wrong um i mean i think it's right but we'll, we'll see maybe, maybe, maybe okay so the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and then I compare that to 1 John chapter 4 that says perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. So, so those who are perfected in love don't fear. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it says. Okay, so you got the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then, and then you have perfect love casts out fear. Those who love do not fear. Mm. Fear has torment. So, so here's here's my little idea. Let's see what you think of it. Let's see what the, everybody else thinks about this idea. Chime in in the chat if you think this idea is, is truth or heresy. I think there's a possibility that there's there's one sense as we turn the diamond of this subject that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but not its end. Hmm. Now I'm using the word end here in the sense of it's it's teleological in its trajectory so so the fear of the lord is the beginning you know it gets my attention i'm like oh you know i don't want to do anything wrong because god is big and awesome and more powerful than me and, and and i don't want to displease him because after all he's god and i'm not you know the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and i need that i need that a child's beginning of, you know, a good life is to legitimately fear daddy and mommy and to do what daddy and mommy say, right? Because daddy and mommy know more than, than the children know. But aren't the parents hoping that the children will grow up and brush their teeth on autopilot rather than under fear of mommy and daddy? Because now they understand the science of tooth decay and <laughs> you know, and, and they, 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 they want to have shiny white teeth and flash a smile and, you know, so do you see what I'm saying? So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but the way I've won, I've thought about it over the years is the moment I come to God on the premise of being afraid of being lost, mm. he immediately accepts me on that premise and then goes about the work of healing that misconception in me so that i end up staying with the lord not for fear of being lost but for all of the lord's goodness and love so the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and love is its end hmm. is, that, is that heresy or is that truth i don't think it's heresy I'm I'm gonna oh, because I think that the fear of the well, Lord. Well, I don't care what you say, Cassie, because D in the chat agrees. Okay. <laughs> I <laughs> no, I do care what you think. <laughs> Unpack it. <laughs> Go. I'm just thinking about now when it comes to the telos, like 
Is the highest form of our relationship with God primarily characterized by our being impressed with his power? I, I think that's not the, the, that's uh, not the, yeah, that's, that's not the ultimate goal, right? Right. Um, it's certainly not to leave us shaking in our boots. Like we one day are going to walk in a recreated world in a new Jerusalem where God will sit on his throne in the middle of the city and be the light of that city. Mm, mm. We're not going to be shaking in our boots in the new Jerusalem, right? Right. Because if you shake in your boots, you know, perpetually, you end up with anxiety disorder. And <laughs> yeah, that's right. That couldn't to. possibly be true. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I think what the, the verse that's coming to my mind about this is um, second, second Corinthians 5, 10 and 11, where Paul is saying, second Corinthians 5, 10 basically says, we know that we'll appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. And therefore we, we, we do this Christian ministry with the utmost integrity, right? Yeah. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. But we ourselves are well known to God. There's a there's yeah. a comfort there, but there's still a restraining influence of knowing that God is God. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. But what motivates? That's second Corinthians 5 14. For the love of Christ urges us on. That's the motivational factor. That's the motivation. And and there will come a time when when I think there, there will come a time, I think you're right, that that real mm. tell off, that real end is so fulfilled in us. And maybe that, I don't know mm. if, that's, if that's psychologically or eschatologically, but we're, we're both. literally be only, we won't, fear will be so far removed from our psyche. It yeah. might be there somewhere on some distant horizon, but it has so mm. little to do with our actual lived experience. Yeah, it's yeah. As if it isn't, has no yeah. part. That's, that's uh, Steph. That's good. Steph in the chat done something for us here. Uh, she says that that fear um, produces humility, which produces faith, which produces love. That's really good. I love that because that's basically the trajectory that I had said in short form that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and love is its end. You know, fear is a good place to start, but it's not a good place to hang out for eternity. That's what you're saying. You know, yeah. fear is a good place to, oh, my attention is arrested mm -hmm. and now I'm looking in the right direction. Lord, what should I do? Yes. Now I enter into relationship with the Lord and he says, well, the first thing we're going to do is you need to calm down, Ty, because I like you. <laughs> now that you're calming down and you're not trembling anymore, let me communicate with you. And yes. the communication process emancipates me, liberates me from everything that would hold me captive mm -hmm. to an ungodly and unhealthy fear of God. Amen. Right? Yeah. Hi, Allie. Hey, Ty. She just snuck on up there and listened so patiently. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I'm learning a lot. This is good. So do we have any questions? We do. We do have a couple. Um, this first one is from Linda. And Linda asks, Hi, Linda. the voice of condemnation and the voice of love, how can you mm. tell the difference? Well, for me, I will go back for emphasis to my little experiment, my little psychological, spiritual experiment, because people have asked me this over the years, you know, well, Ty, you know, how do I know if I have the right kind of fear dynamic with God? Well, Linda, you can know if it's condemnation that's driving you or love that is driving you because when you sin, when you fail, when you fall, when you blow it, is your, is your, is your immediate impulse to go to God for restoration and forgiveness and, mm -hmm. or is your inclination to run and hide and say, you know, I don't, you know, God couldn't possibly want anything to do with me now. So, so, so over the years, people have said to me, when people have said to me, well, I've sinned, you know, what I did was so bad and I've sinned so horribly that God couldn't possibly forgive me again. I kind of snapped them out of that by saying, wow, 
that's an extremely low opinion of God. Mm -hmm. They say, what? No, no, no. It's a low opinion of me. I'm the sinner. I'm the one that sinned. No, it's a low opinion of God. You're assuming that God is a petty miser when it comes to grace. You wow. think that God, you think that God is so lame that he won't forgive you. I'm telling you that God is better than you think. And he, he actually, he's already forgiven you. You're just, you know, unconscious of the fact that he's already, he's in forgiveness mode. That's, that's his default mode. He's just there, 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 there. Right. So Linda condemnation, condemnation will drive a person into hiding away from God. Mm -hmm. But his forgiveness will open you up and bring you to him as a good father. God is good. Um, also, I'll just add this because some people uh, ask God to forgive them over and over and over again mm -hmm. for the same thing. And yes. it's like groveling. It's like God is a pagan deity that is mm -hmm. hard. Oh, he's so hard. I mean, I better ask him again. I better ask him again. I better ask him again. You know, if I, if, 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 you know, I remember years ago, I, not that it hasn't happened recently, but this experience happened, you know, years ago where I was apologizing to Sue like three, four, five days in a row. And she just got tired of it. <laughs> she said, what do you, what, what do you think? I hate you. I said, what? She said, why are you, I forgave you four days ago and you're still apologizing for the same thing over and over again. You must think I'm, I'm pretty, you know, hardcore. I'm not that hard. I love you, Ty. I love you. I forgave you the first time you asked. You don't need to, you don't need to ask over and over again. You know, there was one time when I, I hurt her and I said, well, Sue, can I buy you something? This is when I was like in my twenties and so stupid. I can't even hardly imagine <laughs> can I buy you something? She said, she said, Sue, Ty, you want to buy me something to get me to forgive you? That's a pretty low opinion of me. No, you can't, you can't buy me anything to, to, you know, no, Ty, no, no. I already forgive you. That's a done deal, but I don't know. What do you want to buy me? Cause I'll take that too. <laughs> <laughs> So That's yeah, great. God is good, Linda. God is good. I like that. Cassia, do you have anything to add to that? I was just, I was just, yes and amen. And thinking about God's spirit, he bears to us the testimony of Messiah Jesus, right? That's yeah. what the Bible tells us. The message of, of the spirit, the one who speaks to our hearts, the one mm -hmm. who communicates mm -hmm. God's truth to us. Mm -hmm always tells us about Jesus. What will it say about Jesus? Will the spirit say, will he say, um, will he, will he not mention the, the sacrifice of Christ for our sake? Will he not mention that Christ stands always mm. receiving our prayers with gladness and, and bring them up with joy? Yeah, yeah. Will he, will he forget to mention that he's our our king, our savior, our intercessor, that he made himself our brother in order to adopt us into our family. I think if a voice is leaving out mm -hmm. the testimony of the mercy and ministry of Jesus, you can't trust that voice. And that, whether that's yeah, a, yeah. Your head, yeah. a voice from yeah. some book or, or some preacher, I don't trust that voice. No. I love that. No, yeah, that is so powerful. Mm -hmm. I think it might be the same Linda in the chat is saying, well, how do I change the feeling of condemnation after I repent? How do I change the feeling? Okay, so first of all, Linda, this is a, this is a legit experience. People experience, I experienced that where the feeling lingers, right? The feeling lingers, you know, I, I've, I've reconnected with the Lord, but the feeling of condemnation, well, you know, I don't know exactly what that is in every person's experience, but it is good to hate sin. So if you just feel like, oh man, why did I do that? That's just going to kind of you know subside from your emotions with time as you get space between you and, and whatever you did that you repented of that you feel so bad about. Mm -hmm. um, I would, on the one hand, Linda, I would thank the Lord that you have a sensitive conscience. You know, think, think about this. Would you rather, you know, feel those feelings of, ah, you know, why did I do that? 
and 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 have to you have a few days or a week to get over it or would you rather be able to sin with impunity and feel nothing mm. to to sin and feel nothing there's a diagnosis for that that's called psychopathy that's you know the the definition of a psychopath is somebody who can do evil things and not feel bad about it basically mm. that's that's what it is and so yeah it's those feelings just might be your feelings, Linda. Mm -hmm. They might just be your feelings and they're gonna subside with time. They're gonna oh. subside with time, but keep feasting your mind on the love of God. You've heard of hormone replacement therapy, no doubt, because it's big in the, in the, in the, the news. We need the theology replacement therapy. <laughs> I was wondering where you, you know? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you how to get an infusion of that theology replacement therapy then. Mm. And that is, celebrate before God, confess. Okay, you confess the sin, you received his forgiveness. Now confess yeah. how good he is. Now pray mm -hmm. and pray aloud. And and this is what Saul, this, this is what, what, what does that therapy for me. If I were to find myself in that situation is I'm gonna go to scripture. I'm gonna go to yeah. Psalm 130. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, mm. if, if you should mark iniquity, nobody could ever stand, but with you there's forgiveness. You know, I'm yes, going to go to three and I'm going to praise his name. I'm going to go to Ephesians one. God, wow. Blessed be you. You've seated me in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I'm going to start. Yes. Celebrating yeah. Yeah. And get my mm. mind to, to grasp onto that truth because there's more truth mm, out there. Mm, mm, the truth yeah. of my mistakes and a little bit of God's forgiveness. The, the praise God is how, the, the, just buckets of blessings, buckets of blessings. So I'm going to bucket, bucket, buckets of blessing. I love that. I love that too. Hey, um, why does Jonathan Leonardo feel like he can just jump in the middle of our study and uh, start chiming in? He's in the chat over here. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. This is a good thought. <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan, who was with us uh, last time, Jonathan says, feelings aren't the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Jonathan says, feelings aren't the Lord, Linda. There you have it. That's true. That's so That's good. the Lord in, instead of your feelings. Yeah. Mm, feelings are not the Lord. All right. And Linda now says, wow, 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 wow. That's five wows from Linda. And Cassandra <laughs> loves the word buckets. She says buckets. Yes, buckets <laughs> of blessings. <laughs> and All right. uh, yeah, yeah. Any other questions or... Um, we here. actually don't have that many days. Um, this is a little different, but I actually had a question, if that's okay. I normally am the question asker, but is it okay if I ask a question? Oh, mm -hmm. wait, wait, hold on. It's Chris who is quoting Jonathan Leonardo in the chat. Oh. <laughs> Feelings aren't the Lord. I just want to correct that. Jonathan, Jonathan didn't, well, Jonathan said that apparently, and Chris is quoting Jonathan. It's a good thing. Feelings aren't the Lord. End of quote. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Allie. Yeah, I was just wondering, I really liked what you said, Kessia, about uh, Jesus being a fierce savior. Um, I don't think I grew up thinking about Jesus that way. And I'm wondering if you feel like we talk about him being a fierce savior enough, generally in the church. And if we don't, why not? We don't. Because it's like, like when I read the Chronicles of Narnia like three years ago for the first time, the whole idea of Jesus being like Aslan. She read mine, by the way, and she hasn't. She read mine, by the way, and she hasn't given them back to me. Because <laughs> they're really good. Them. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's she took them from my house, and she has not returned them. But that's okay. <laughs> Actually, wait. Oh yeah, no, I didn't. They're like right behind me. Um, anyway, no, but um, that was a new like revelation for me to think it kind of merged this idea of you can have a mm. moral revere for God and what that looks like. And yeah, so I'm just curious, like, why don't we, why do you think we don't talk about that more? Oh, I, I thank you for asking actually, truly. I, I actually, so I have, I have two, two little girls, two year old, two years mm -hmm. old and three years old. And, you know, we love to take them to their Bible class and we sing songs and I love all of these songs. Right. And, and they, paint this picture of God as so loving and kind and he cares about the little things, all of which are true. Mm -hmm. But then when they come home, I tell them about how powerful God is. <laughs> I think, I think it's, you know, this response to power means domination, right? Mm -hmm. In our mind, because mm -hmm. everywhere you look, <clears throat> 
people are always using power for themselves. Now, again, mm. in the Bible, the fear of the Lord means not abusing our own power and advantages. That's what yeah. it means. Evil. That's why. That's why it says, you know, don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind. Fear the Lord. Right. He joins mm -hmm. both together. But God has all the power with none of the evil and none right. of the desire to subjugate, yeah. erase, dominate, yeah. and destroy. Yeah. But I think we haven't we, we haven't found that balance. So maybe it's just a pendulum swing. You know, there was yeah. a time when when the Christian God was out there like a stern judge looking for people's faults, mm -hmm. just trying to find a record so he could kick him out of heaven, you know, and then we're like, oh, not that. He's actually really kind and good. And we took it, we took it for granted that he was powerful because that's what we all mm -hmm. always knew. And so I think the idea of of Jesus as, as meek he was, as mm -hmm. mild, I don't he wasn't. Was he mild? Was he like the lamest sauce from Taco Bell, you know? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's that, no. That federal no. dryer that never gets the stuff dry. You know, I, you know, he was he was he was humble, but we can only understand that humility if we understand his power, if we yeah. understand his strength. Yeah. We understand wow. that he, wow. he bears wow. every right and he owes you nothing, but he gave it to you for free. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the, we need both. We can't understand his beauty if we don't yeah. understand him as strong and fierce and zealous. And he, yeah. my Jesus in Revelation 1, his eyes are like fire, his feet glow like bronze in a furnace. You know, mm. he, he's yeah. not the weak sauce. Yeah. Now, years ago, there was a woman who was kidnapped by mm -hmm. a, a man in the United States, and he abducted her, put her in his car, drove off into the wilderness to a cabin, um, you know, put her in the bathtub and sat there on the toilet with a gun. To her head trying to work up the courage to do dastardly deeds not trying to work up the courage but just like tormenting her you know psychologically and so on and the story was really fascinating you guys because this woman did something so amazing she said things like this to him you know he, he captured her put her in the bathtub sat there with a the gun and she she said hey could i turn around because you're over here and i'm over here and i can't see can't, oh okay go ahead so she turns around, now they're face to face. She's laying in the bathtub, picture this, and he's sitting here on the toilet holding the gun to her head. And she says, you don't wanna do this because I'm gonna tell God on you. And God is, listen, you don't wanna do this. To, I'm his daughter and he loves me very much. And you're gonna be in the biggest trouble that anybody has ever been in. If you, you better let me go, because if you don't, I'm telling my heavenly father everything that you've done and you don't want to mess with him because he loves me very, very much. And they began having a conversation and she began reading different gospel readings to him um for from a a book that was in her belongings you know when he captured her and took her oh wait a minute siri thinks i'm talking to her so 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 you know the the, the anyways he he never he he did kidnap her but he ended up letting her go because he said i'm not messing with this lady because I, god is on her side and and so there's a sense in which you know, you wouldn't want a a mild God who can do who would do no harm. I mean, think about it. If if God can look at the horrific things taking place in our world and not feel anything about it, then God is not psychologically well adjusted. Right. So yeah. for God to be God, God would have to be pretty, pretty, you know, legitimately angry about 
violation and abuse, you know, and horrific things that people do to one another. But yeah, that I just remembered that story because, you know, you're talking about is God fierce? And this lady literally, you know, talked this guy into letting her go on the premise that God is on her side and, you know, you, you better let me go because I'm going to tell on you. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> that is crazy. really insane well now you need oh now, now we need we all know what to do if you're ever abducted <laughs> don't just be all terrified reason with the person you know yeah oh god Say, hey i know okay. you talk to me but you want to do bible studies because <laughs> <laughs> all right well i think it's time to wrap things up i didn't realize how long we'd gone um kessia thank you so much for joining us mm, ty yes. thank you too it was really great to have you guys here and everybody just to close out we want to thank you all so much for coming and just remind you that we will be doing this again next week same time 5 p.m pacific daylight time and you can sign up for next week's study at the button at the bottom or the middle of your screen also, some of you are asking, yes, this is recorded and you'll be able to rewatch, uh, watch the replay at lightbearers.org slash live. And I think that's everything we needed to cover. So yeah, join us next week, bring a friend, tell your friends. We hope you enjoyed this. And thank you all so much for coming. We'll see you guys next time. Bye everybody.